Good to see you at worship this morning. Uh, thank you for your prayers and lovely vacation. We had a great time. Uh, it was wonderful, but it's good to be back home. Uh, a couple of announcements, just very briefly. Uh, one, if you were on the back and you saw Golden Oldies, we are actually having our brunch this week. Um, we're going to uh, see how that goes and uh, have fun with that. We're also uh, going to be having uh, our session meeting on Tuesday night. So if you have any items of business or any points of concern or anything that needs to go before the session, uh, you can email me that. Uh, also, just as a kind of, I try to make this reminder, at least periodically, session meetings are public meetings. So if you ever need a cure for insomnia, you're always welcome to come uh, and take a nap in uh, the back. Uh, no, in all seriousness, it's 6.30 Tuesday. Just let me know if you want to come, and I'll make sure uh, that we have enough food for you and such. Uh, and then also, uh, this evening, uh, we will be having uh, evening worship at Redeeming Grace. Uh, Robert will be preaching, and it will be lovely as usual. Take a few moments as the prelude is played and prepare your hearts to meet with God. If the Lord has made you able, please stand. <clears throat> Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Let's sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
our Father and our God, it is indeed a great privilege to be gathered together with the people of God on this your day. What a joy. In your house, with your people, in your presence. And we praise you that this is all possible, accomplished in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That we may be in your presence in Christ, not in our own merit. <laughs> For then we would come into your presence as objects of wrath. Instead, we come as beloved children, redeemed by the great mediator. We thank you that we can come into your presence in Christ Jesus, bringing joy and delight and offerings of obedience and service, not even our own offerings, but bringing Christ. We praise you. We praise you that we can have your spirit within us, working even in our frailty, conquering the lingering corruption of sin. We praise you. And, O oh God, we do ask that even in this hour, as our flesh, our bodies are so weak, Distractions are plentiful. Weariness seems to be crouching at the door. Would instead your spirit be active in us that we would be shaped more and more into the image of Christ even as we serve you and glorify your name. It's for your name's sake that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Statement of need is Jeremiah 17. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on the horns of their altars, while their children remember their altars and their asherim, beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains and the open country. Your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets rich but not by justice. In the midst of his days they will leave him, and at his end he will be a fool. The glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Obviously, that verse 9, and the famous verse, or probably most famous verse of this uh, section, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. I know the American answer is, well, uh, I am better than my neighbor. Right? At least I'm not like that guy. I'm, I'm better than uh, that other person. And 
that argument holds up sometimes if we only look at kind of external actions. The defeater to that is obviously, well, what would happen if your heart were on display? That inner monologue that happens inside your mind, the way you think of your neighbor or your loved ones or your enemies or those that you hate, the, the deeds that are done only in your mind, and that argument's defeated pretty quickly. It's for this reason that we confess our sins. Though we are redeemed by Christ uh, and that inner monologue is changed, <laughs> it's not yet finished, as you yourself know from this morning and this week. So we confess our sins to our God. Our Heavenly Father, giver of every good and perfect gift, we come now to confess our many sins to You. In Your everlasting love, You have graciously provided for us. In our sin, we have thought ourselves to be rich and self-sufficient. In Your providence, we have been amply supplied. In our sin, we have hoarded and coveted. Forgive these and all our many offenses. We pray through the merit and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing Come Thou Fount. Please be seated. <clears throat> John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Let us go to our God in prayer. Father, we are commanded in Your Scriptures to come and bless You. All of your servants to bless you, the Lord, to bless you by day and by night, to bless you in your holy house, to bless you, the one who has made heaven and earth. And it is easy for us to bless you when we contemplate 
all of your many mercies. As we contemplate the way that you have made us, your wisdom and creativity, as we contemplate the way that you have preserved us, your perfect providence and faithfulness, as we contemplate the way that you have redeemed us, with Christ Jesus purchasing us back from your wrath in the grave. However, Lord, it is sometimes difficult for us to bless you and to praise you when the many weights of this life press in on our minds. We know in your scriptures we are told that we're not to be anxious about anything. But yet many times we are. And so we turn to an, in obedience to the remedy that you have presented in your word, not to be anxious in anything but in everything. With thanksgiving, to lay before you our needs and our requests in prayer so that your peace would fill our hearts and minds. And so we do, we pray, O oh God, we pray for your church. And we recognize this year has been a challenging year for so many in your church. Where even now parts of this great country of ours have actually made it illegal to sing your praises in worship services. Or made it increasingly difficult to meet together as the body of Christ. We recognize that a a dangerous virus has kept many away, and so your people have been scattered in our own homes and not gathered together in the house of God. Lord, we praise you that these concerns, the many other concerns that are taking place in our, our country, all of the um, challenges of the, the world in which we live currently, we praise you. That though they weigh heavy on our hearts, you are God over them. Your providence is mightier than even they are. And there is nothing that can snatch us out of your hand. We praise you for that reminder in John 6 that all that you have given to the Son, the Son will redeem and present back to you. Nothing can take us out of his perfect ministry. And so, Lord, we do pray for your church. We pray that you would work in your church. And specifically, we pray that you would give your people love for the Bible. That you would give your people delight in your word, that we would meditate on it day and night, that it would be sweeter than honey on our lips. That we would be able to turn to Psalm 119, which meditates and extols the virtues of your law, and we would delight in passages like that. We pray for your people. And you, we ask that you would give us faith. We recognize that perhaps uh, one of the weaknesses of the American church could indeed be our faith. And we, we turn so quickly to be preoccupied with our struggles and not uh, cling as tightly as we could or should to your promises and so we ask that you would give us faith. And we know that you use suffering to do that, and we ask even these days would be used to accomplish that faith in our hearts. And we ask that you would give us holiness and piety. And we are your people. We are to be marked by a godliness as we are to be in your image. We are your children. We are to live in a way that showcases your character, and we ask that that would indeed be fulfilled in your people. That we would be a people of holy hands and holy hearts and holy mouths with godliness spilling forth. And, O oh Lord, we ask that you would make us to be a people of love. Love for you, love for our brothers and sisters, love for, even for our neighbor. And Lord, we ask that you would Make us incredibly wise. And these days are complicated, and we have been told that we are to be shrewd as serpents and gentle as doves. In fact, actually, we tend to be the exact opposite of that in so many cases. 
are foolish and running headlong into running our mouths. Instead, we ask that you would make us wise, that we would be shrewd, that we would be careful and cautious, but also so tender that we would showcase your mercy to a lost and dying world and that you would even be so gracious as to use your people to gather and perfect the saints. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing all glory, laud, and honor. Amen. Be seated, please. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, we're going to have this week and then, Lord willing, again, if all goes according to plan, uh, next week we're um, kind of two one-off sermons in, in preparation for uh, end of summer, and then we're going to jump into Matthew. It is the last book in the New Testament that I've not taught or preached through my ministry uh, in this church, so we'll be there for quite a while, <laughs> uh, probably a couple of years. Um, so I think we have the sermons already planned out through the end of next summer, and that's about halfway through Matthew, so uh, you've got a, you've got a time there. Psalm 27, Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in His tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Oh God, you have spoken in the reading of your word. And we thank you that we may hear your voice as you speak. We ask now that we would hear your voice in the preaching. Give light and life to your word in our hearts, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. <clears throat> On July 4th, this last week, significant, well, I guess a week and a half now, a week and a day, until my internal calendar's all off from vacation, I don't know what day it is. I know it's Sunday, I'm here, that's good. One of those major turning points in history. As a student of history, it's always fun to look back and you can kind of see in nations or see in the world or see even in something as simple as the family. Those kind of moments in time that you can kind of track back and say, that was a turning point in history. I mean, you all have those moments, that, that time that you took this job instead of that job. And that was a turning point in your family history. Or uh, you did this instead of that. You chose this path instead of that path. You, you went this way instead of that. And, and it changed everything. Some of those cases, you may not be exactly sure if it was good or bad, but you know that it made a major change in your life. I remember a number of years ago, I was on a mission trip on July 4th, a mission trip to the UK. And one of the young ladies on our mission team was so excited, and she's like, I, I just love fireworks. I can't wait to see how the British do fireworks, how they celebrate the 4th of July. Oh, boy. Yeah, you're going to be a little disappointed in a couple of days don't think they view that day quite as happily as we do, do they? I guess from perspective, it's a really good day for us, maybe not quite as good day for them, but it's certainly kind of a major turning point in the history of two nations and the history of the world. Years ago, when I first started pastoring this church, we had an elder who used to say, uh, he said, that the trick with being an elder is being able to distinguish the important decisions before you make them. 
You're going to make decisions all of the time, and usually hindsight being 2020 can figure out fairly well which ones were the important ones. A really very blessed and wise elder is the one who sees that coming. Uh, I'm going to humbly suggest in this week's sermon and next week's are both kind of in preparation for our own sort of July 4th kind of major turning point in Christ Ridge history uh, as we have, God willing, you know, this lovely building going up right across the parking lot. Lord willing, we're not that many weeks away from being able to get in there. Two months tops, Lord willing, again, pending any sort of craziness happening, which... eh, This year, who knows? And I suspect that uh, when or if there were ever history books written about this church, uh, they're going to look back and say that the day that we got into that building was a major turning point in this church's history. I can't tell you if they're going to look back and say it was a good thing or not. might not be, actually. But it is going to be a major turning point. Things are going to change. I'm not going to have to worry quite so much that when I give the benediction, I'm going to hit somebody's face sitting right here on the front row. I'm not going to have singing where I can touch the ceiling in the middle of the sermon. It's going to be a very different sort of building, a very different sort of feel. And so this week and next week, wanted to take two kind of one-off sermons to help us think about being ready to go into that building. Psalm 27 is uh, one of them, will be in the New Testament next week, but wanted to just draw out a couple of themes from this passage that I think are going to be incredibly important as we kind of shape our minds to worship together in that new and bigger building. We go back to, Lord willing, one service, the people of God gathered together. The first thing we're going to look at here is in, in verses one 2 and 3, David is beginning his meditation on God uh, and God's uh, relationship with him and begins by kind of acknowledging uh, the complicated nature of David's life. David's a godly man, right? He's the one that we know is the man after God's own heart, a a thing I would love to have written on my tombstone, right? Can you imagine that? You, You die and you actually have the Lord's endorsement. This is a man after God's own heart. Wow. But even with that endorsement, David's life is messy at best. I mean, murder, mm, adultery, mm, conspiracy to commit both, uh, all kinds of mess inside his family. It's a complicated life and spent the first, I guess, third of his reign running from the actual king. And here in verses 1 through 3, he, he lays out really kind of, I think, a very healthy approach to looking at the complexities of the world. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Now again, for us, the idea of a stronghold maybe not quite so interesting or such a good encouragement, but for him to have a refuge, to have a stronghold would have been incredibly important. Think about the number of years he spent running from Saul. Or even running from his own children. Having to flee even to his own enemies to hide from the people of God or those who proclaimed they were who were trying to kill him. But even in the midst of this, if if God is my light, if God is my salvation, if God is my refuge, if God is my strength, who do I need to be afraid of? What do I need to be concerned about? Why do I need to have anxiety? Why do I need to have this debilitating fear? Why do I need to be afraid? Our first principle I'd like to examine just briefly is when God's people are to confront our fears with the character of God. To confront our fears with the character of God. He's done it here in verse 1 as he's asked this rhetorical question. And you can tell from the answer uh, that he's implying, well, who do I need to be afraid of? Well, nobody. I don't have to be afraid of anyone. I don't have to be afraid of the 
king. I don't have to be afraid of my children. I don't have to be afraid of my enemies. I have the Lord. I have the covenant keeping God. I have the one who has promised me that he loves me and cares for me. I have, notice again, covenant name, he, the covenant of God. In fact, actually, this covenant-keeping God is so careful in His protection that in verse 2, when when those seek to do me evil, come at me, guess what? They're the ones who have difficulty. It's not me. I mean, they, they may have minor victories for a spell. They may have minor victories for a time, but it is they who stumble and fall. In fact, actually, even though an army encamp against me, I love it. Boy, David, that's a bit kind of, you know, blustery, I guess. Though an an entire army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Ironically, actually, this has happened to him multiple times. Think about even when he's likely a teenager and going out and fighting a giant with the entire army behind him because he trusted that the Lord was the one who would care for him. I don't have to be afraid of the enemies of God. I do not have to be afraid of anything. For the Lord is my provider, my protector. God's people are to confront our fears with the character of our God, for He is the good and righteous God, the covenant-keeping the God, the one who has pledged himself for us. And you think, well, that is a really weird first point for talking about moving into a new building. I mean, that's a really odd point. I mean, you preached some weird sermons over the last decade or so, but this might top it. Well, not really, actually, if you think about it. My thought process is this. As we go into that building, we have more space. More space means more complications. More complications oftentimes means more sin, and more sin can easily mean more anxiety. More opportunities to hurt each other's feelings, more opportunities to sin against one another, more opportunities for suffering. See, I see that building as a a great opportunity for us uh, to grow as a body, to participate in the gathering and perfecting of the saints uh, in a new and greater fashion. But I also see it as a tremendous opportunity for difficulty and for suffering. I mean, just think about it this way. The more people we have in that building, the more sin comes in there. Because that's what we bring with us. We have a building that we can finally see from the road so that we'll have people stopping in off of the street that have no idea what they're walking into. I haven't really had that in the history of this church. I mean, being tucked away behind the berm and then the berm being gone but still hidden on the back of the property. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations where I talk with people about where I pastor and they say, oh, there's a church there? Well, I don't say that anymore. Can't miss it. And I suspect that as we continue and go into that building, I I suspect that we're going to see increasing amounts of opportunity for fears to slowly creep in and to kind of dig into the back of our minds and begin to kind of lay their horrible parasitic eggs and creep into our souls. As we begin to have a a room that could be filled with people that aren't like us, that we don't know, that we don't recognize. I mean, think about it this way. I mean, think about just the way that fear has worked even in our own body, just in relationship to the coronavirus. And how easy it's been for us to have either fear of the virus or or fear of man or fear of death or fear of all kinds of things creeping into our minds and poisoning us from the inside out. And I love how David's answer is, 
is not to, to kind of say that there's no difficulties. He acknowledges actually evildoers in every part of this. It's not to act like there, there aren't people out to get him. They are. In fact, almost all of his life is marked by people trying to kill him. Instead, it's to anchor all of his hopes in the one who is bigger than that. The one who is mightier. Matthew would record Jesus making a similar point. You don't need to be afraid of those who can kill the body. Right? What's the worst they can do? Send you to meet Jesus. Instead, be afraid of the one who can kill the soul. God Almighty. The one who can throw you into hell. Now, he won't if you're his child. But properly ordering our fears so that we're not concerned with the... Um, small and minor irritations of man, but instead concerned with the mind of our God. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, I, I suspect one of the great fears that's going to be a challenge for us in that new building is an increasing um, temptation to have a fear of man. You see, in our current building... This is one of the beauties and blessings of this building. It's a marvelous building. But a lot of the fear of man part of this is sorted out in the parking lot. People pull in the parking lot. They see a humble building. They get right back in their car. They turn around. They drive away. We never have to deal with that. We don't have to deal with the pride and the arrogance. We never have to deal with uh, the, the shame. We, we don't deal with any of those sorts of things. We have a building that we love and we use, and those that come in love it and use it, and we have a great time. I suspect, however, with our new building, there's going to be an increasing temptation to fall in love with a sense of self-importance, to fall in love with a fear of man. And brothers and sisters, the answer is going to be we're going to have to keep our, our minds and our hearts grounded in the character of God. It does not matter what they say. It matters what our God says. I don't know if he knew the Lord. Uh, John Prines, a famous um, uh, wrote songs, a singer-songwriter type, died of COVID just a matter of weeks ago. Um, but one of his famous songs, if you know it, is Turn Off Your TV. <laughs> that's, the, that's the chorus. Just turn off the TV. And I suspect that that's going to be one of those habits that might maybe benefit us a little bit. Maybe not quite be so entranced uh, by the news. For you younger folks who don't actually watch TV, I would say turn off social media. Turn off Facebook. Turn off Twitter. Instead, listen to the voice of the Lord. David lays it out here in verses 1 through 3, this challenge to, to, to be encouraged by the character of God, not just... Uh, kind of ignoring the challenges of the world around him. Uh, from there, he, he then moves to what I'm going to suggest I think is going to be probably a second major danger for us. Verses 1 through 3, he lays out that the character of God is the solution for fear. In verses 4 through 6, he then explains what his greatest desire is. What is that which he wants more than anything else? And again, if, if we were to have this sort of conversation, this is one that I've, I've seen happen so often. If you talk with Christians about heaven, what do they say? They say, I look forward to heaven because I won't sin anymore. I look forward to heaven because that's where my family will be. I look forward to heaven because I won't, I won't have pain anymore. There will be no tears. There will be no sadness. And it's intriguing. What we answer are all of the secondary benefits. In fact, actually, what we're describing is the same life that we live now, just a little bit better. David gets it right. He doesn't go for this life, just a little bit better. He, he actually sees something much better than this life being at stake. One thing I've asked for, and that's what I'm going to seek after. That I may be with God. That I'll dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I'll be in God's presence. I'll gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. And to inquire in His temple. 
again, I wonder is if we were to list through, you know, just the blessings of heaven, how, how long does it take us before we get to, we get to the beauty of God? To marvel at the glory of our Lord, to just gaze at His majesty in Christ Jesus. You see, again, I, I think this is that great temptation for us is the buildings are wonderful tools and now we're going to have a building where we all can actually sit in it at the same time and not have to sit on each other's laps in order to accomplish that. But there's this easy temptation to, to again, have secondary things become the driving thing. A temptation to fall in love with the joy that we have from each other. And, and that's a good thing. We should have joy with each other. To fall in love with the way that we can take care of each other or be taken care of by each other. To fall in love with evangelism and reaching the lost. Notice all of these things are good things. To fall in love with seeing little babies be baptized and to have the name of the triune God placed upon them. I've told you, I look forward to this, hearing the songs of Zion in that building. I look forward to the singing of the people of God. All of these are good and godly and, and, and lovely and holy things but they are all secondary things. One thing. One thing is the biggest. It's the most. It's the thing that drives it all. It's the engine that's driving the car. It's to be in the presence of God. To be in the presence of God. To be with Him, to know Him, and to be known by Him. And brothers and sisters, again, I do wonder. I, this is one of those great worries that bothers my pastor's heart where we have such, again, a, a lovely and robust and blessed church with so many lovely things. And it's the sweetest, kindest church I have ever seen. And it's with any set of great strengths, I always immediately wonder what, what are the weaknesses that come with it. And there's that danger that we have so many beautiful secondary things that we forget the one big one. Now we have a building to match. It's going to be beautiful. Should be very functional as well. Should be a great blessing to our ministry. Are we going to be able to continue remembering that God, our God, is the driving passion? His face is our highest aim. And I would suggest humbly this is a particular danger for us. As again, in America, I've mentioned this the last several weeks, where um, with our, our kind of consumer mentality, we so much more focus on what we can get out of the church. What blessings we can get. How can we be ministered to instead of focusing on how can I meet with God? It's why I think the devil's attack on the church and the coronavirus has been so wonderfully successful. You don't get to meet with God in His presence the way that you do in the corporate worship service anywhere else. Private Bible reading is good. You should do it. I mean, absolutely, you should do it. Family Bible reading is good. Absolutely, you should do it. But nothing can compare meeting with God in His presence with the people of God like this. Foreshadowing the life to come. God's people are to have God's face as their highest aim. Again, all of this is only possible in Christ Jesus. He is the one who has guaranteed God's affection in verses 1 through 3. He is the one who is the mediator who gives us access into God's presence in verses 4 through 6. In verse 7 through 10, this is the hard part, actually. 
1 through 6 lay out this kind of beautiful, confident song that David lays out of, of meditating on God and his, his beauty, meditating with confidence on God's provision, meditating with confidence in how God cares for him. In 7, there's a major tone change where it switches to David pouring out his heart, requesting that God would do certain things. Look at verses 7 through 10. What he does here is he's crying out to God, right? Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me. You have said, you've told me to seek your face. My heart says to you, that's what I'm trying to do. But I need you to be the one to meet with me. Don't turn me away in anger. Don't cast me off or forsake me. I need you to meet with me. I love what's being highlighted here is in verses 1 through 3, you get to see God's character is the solution to fear. In 4 through 6, it's presenting God's presence as the highest good, the highest goal for Christians. 7 through 10 immediately then showcases, well, you've got to work at it. You have to work at it. You you can't just sit there like a lump on a log and expect that it's going to go well for you. I mean, the Lord loves you. He's going to care for you. He's going to complete your sanctification, whether or not you you want it to be. If you're his child, he's going to sanctify you. Uh, The issue is, uh, as I've said before, there's two different ways to learn. There's the easy way and the hard way. The easy way and the hard way. The easy way is to work as hard as you can for the Lord's cause, to learn uh, as quickly and as rapidly and as easily as you can. The hard way is always the path of suffering. If you don't want to learn, He will sanctify you. He will provide those difficult enough circumstances to make sure that you learn. He loves you so much. But if we do want to accomplish those things where we do want to have our fears solved by the character of God, if we do want to have God's face as our highest goal, our our, our greatest good fixed in our minds, you have to work at that. Historically, the running gag in the American church behind closed doors and staff meetings and such like that is that 20% of the church does 80% of the work. That would mean in a church of this size, 20 people do 80% of the labor. Now, I can thankfully say as many years as I've been affiliated with this church or know about it even before I was pastor, that has never once been true for Christ Ridge. It's never once been true. I don't want it to become true, though. I don't want it to be a situation where, again, we we get into a building where we're able to to do greater or, or Uh, seemingly greater or larger um, activities or events or numbers of people or anything of the sort like that, and then we suddenly begin to kind of coast. I think that's actually been one of the the great strengths of this church and one of the things the Lord has used uh, most tenderly and most um, powerfully in our midst has been the amount of ministry that is conducted by people that are not officers of the church. The ways that I find out that people have been encouraged or strengthened or built up or had meals provided or things that that is never once passed through the session. We're just working at it. Learning how to be the body of Christ. And I would humbly suggest this is going to be one of those things that is harder in the new building. Again, we, we... In this building, we're so close on each other, and really until about six months ago, we were sitting on each other's laps every Sunday just about. You got to know each other's business, whether you liked it or not, because you were sitting in their business every week. As we get into that bigger building, it's going to be much more of a challenge to maintain that closeness of family, to maintain that closeness of comfort and love and affection. And I would say, please work hard at that. Don't lose the joy of the people of God from that hard work. And I would even say beyond that is to work hard at at specifically what David is, is requesting here in this prayer is working hard at seeing God as that greatest good. I think this is actually probably maybe perhaps for some more of an important issue where 
uh, we would say, I know, I know God is supposed to be the most important to me. I just don't know how. Well, do you ever ask? I mean, do you ever ask him? Lord, I know that you're supposed to be the most important to me, but I don't think that you are, and I don't know how to fix that. Would you please help me? That's what David's asking. You've told me to seek your face, and I'm trying to do that. Oh, God, please make it happen. I want it to be that way. Coupled with this longing to see the face of God, to be in his presence, verses 11 and 12, he then follows that with uh, not just that holy affection for God, but then a, a holy activity. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. They breathe out violence. Here is uh, what's the outworking of this relationship is that not just to have a holy heart that is uh, attuned to loving God, but having holy hands and a holy mouth that live out God's commands that learn God's ways, that learn God's law, and then live accordingly. This would be called piety or or practical godliness. It's it's putting into practice the Word of God uh, so that His people are obedient, so that they look different. Again, it doesn't take that thorough of a study of, of church history to see that the church grows the most powerfully when she is the most different. It's not when she's the most relevant. It's not when she keeps one foot in the pool of culture and one foot on the side of the Bible. That never works. She always gets pulled into the pool of of culture. The church is at her best when she is obeying the Scriptures at all costs. No matter what the world, the flesh, and the devil might say. And taking the scriptures and loving them and and memorizing them and having them shape how we think and how we feel and how we act so that godliness is the flavor of the church. I'm going to suggest that if we continue to do that, it will produce a bit of messiness. And that's okay. Okay. As we figure out what godliness godliness looks like together, it's okay. Because as we do that, you know what? Sometimes you're going to fail and sometimes I'm going to fail. And that means that sometimes we're going to have to apologize. And guess what? That's okay. And it also means that you're going to have to learn to forgive. And that is okay. I know it may not feel that way at the moment. It is okay. I suspect, again, this is going to be one of those things that might not be quite so difficult when we first get into the building, but will increasingly kind of be one of those quiet whispering challenges of how do we as the people of God to continue to live a holy life? And I love how uh, even I think at the end it frames out verses 13 and 14 kind of frame out for us the emotional tone that we're supposed to take in, in thoughts of these. David's wrestling through some very serious challenges. We don't know exactly know what they were uh, for this psalm, but his life was filled with them. So you could pick just about any era and it would fit. But how does he end the psalm? It's not with cynicism and pessimism. It's not ending it going, oh, I know all these other bozos that I have to deal with. Instead, he he ends it with kind of two activities that he's going to devote himself to, believing in God and his word and waiting to see how God will keep his promises. Again, it's not twiddling his thumbs. He's just poured out his heart to the Lord in prayer for the previous five verses. But instead here now, he's, he's looking. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm going to see God answer my prayers. I don't know how. I don't know what that's going to look like. But I know he's going to. And therefore, I'm going to be strong and courageous as I wait for him to do it. It would be my humble request that this would be kind of our emotional tone as we kind of go into that new building. Certainly joy and gratitude as we get our first permanent sanctuary. 
that even as we wrestle through what it means to be church together in there, as we go through the growing pains of figuring out exactly how everything works, that we would say, I believe in the goodness of the Lord, that he will answer our prayers. I'm waiting to see what he will do, and I will work hard in his kingdom in the meantime. And may it be that Christ would be glorified to see his brothers and sisters, those that he has redeemed, children of the Most High, laboring with him as our mediator, with zeal and excitement and kindness and charity and forgiveness in the body of Christ until he comes back. And living in a way that is good preparation for that moment, because it might be tomorrow. Might never get into that building. I'd be okay with that. But being ready for that life to come. May it be that, again, as I've said, our turning point in history as we get into that building, that we would look back and be able to say, what a good thing it was for that church. What a good thing it was for Christ Rich. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that you are providing a building for us. And, oh, Lord, we do confess our hearts are so easily distracted. Our minds are so easily filled with lesser things. In fact, even uh, we must confess that our, our minds are preoccupied with the benefits of salvation instead of the one who gives salvation. And that's not okay. We're sorry. You know our feeble frame, and so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would comfort us and strengthen us, that we would be indeed filled with love for you. Would that love be so great that it would wash away all our fears, anxieties, our concerns, and our sorrows even? that Christ would be all for us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing it as well.
unto him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever.